Hi everyone, and thank you very much, Seiji, for the kind invitation to speak at your 10th Yamagata course. Really a major milestone for you and for endoscopic ear surgery. And Seiji's given me this very interesting talk. It actually seems a little bit lame, the utility of video in endoscopic ear surgery. But I hope to show you why I'm so excited and interested about it and how it's going to have a major impact on us in our surgical education and in established surgeons learning how to improve. So I'm coming to you from Sydney and this is a, a video we took during lockdown last year of a helicopter flight with our fellow at the time, Horace, and Dr. Nicholas Jufus organized it. He's a fixed wing pilot. He's also a member of our endoscopic ear group. But the helicopter pilot today was Dr. Bill Bastic uh, on that day, and he's actually our endoscopic ear anesthetist at Royal North Shore Hospital. And we hope to share similar experiences with you if you actually uh, come down and visit us in Sydney. Uh, and we hope to share our um, lovely city with you. Now the first question is why should we even care about surgical video? Well look at this data, some 10 years old now from the World Health Organization. And in that year there was some 234 million surgical procedures performed and around 7 million morbidity events and 1 million mortality events. And it was estimated that about half of those, so 3.5 million morbidities and half a million preventable surgical deaths. So what's the innovative idea with video? Well, this is the real innovation. And this has really happened in the last few years. And that is now operative skill can be objectively measured with video. And operative skill can be improved with video assessment. And I'll show you how in the last few years we've shown even in established surgeons that we can categorize established surgeons. These are surgeons who've worked for more than 10 years into low, average, and high groups and their morbidity and mortality is quite different. And we can try and push that curve to the right. And this is done actually with videos. So what we'll talk about is a general overview and then we'll look at how we're trying to develop high quality endoscopic e videos. And then we'll see how we apply videos to education for our trainees. How will you apply videos to education for established surgeons and this concept of video surgical coaching and then I'll finish off with a few ideas about safety and ethics and the educational quality of live surgical broadcasting and a couple of very exciting areas including the application of AI as well as this concept of the surgical black box brought to us from our pilot colleagues. So endoscopic ear surgery is really lends itself to the video. It's really inherent to the technique, a little bit different to the microscope but really what we're seeing everyone else is seeing. And the videos provide a raw surgical data output for exactly what's going on. And videos time has really come, and it's really in the last couple of years, where we've got laptops now, you can see with the um, Apple Silicon and with gaming computers now, we have eight terabyte storage on a laptop. And we can analyze with ease these videos. We can subdivide the videos, we can timestamp them, we can annotate them. And we can store them either locally or we can upload them to these sort of sites. So you're all familiar with these sort of sites, C Surgeries or Jove, where we will have time stamped, uploaded videos that are now searchable. And of course, the king of all of these is YouTube. And I spoke about YouTube in the past, but it's really the combination of the power of something like YouTube and the public's appetite for transparency that's really coming together in the last two or three years with the rise of social media, which we're all very familiar with, and Facebook switching to Meta, and the rise of TikTok even since I last spoke to you, and how surgery and the patients are really keen and hungry for this sort of data. We spoke about YouTube a couple of years ago at the Japanese Otology Society and at that time in my talk I mentioned how there really wasn't a lot of otological data around. There was a little bit of data around adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy and grommets. And I spoke to you about how we were doing at the time a study looking at the quality of information for vestibular schwannoma on YouTube. And we were, I demonstrated how we were doing that study. And that study's now been accepted in otology, neurotology for vestibular schwannoma. We've done a similar study for cholesteatoma, which, which really comes up with fairly similar data, showing around 72% of vestibular 
watched one of her content in the last couple of years is of questionable quality. And very interestingly, the popularity did not necessarily correlate with the accuracy of the information. But of course, trainees still use YouTube. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this, but the data supports this. So there's a fair, there's a fair number of papers now published looking at how surgical trainees are using YouTube. And in fact, attendings and consultants are using YouTube to help revise the surgery just prior to when they're doing the operation. So in this scenario, trainees still prefer reading from the books, but when they're doing a surgery, they like to revise the video because, of course, surgery is very much a temporospatial skill. And so video lends itself to that. And when trainees look at videos on YouTube, some 90 to 98 percent of trainees use YouTube to revise. This is a study from Portugal. And in that instance, they like videos that are subdivided, timestamped, annotated. When attendings review videos, and in, in some studies, up to 68% of attendings or consultants use videos to review more complicated procedures, they're looking for more subtleties in the technical skills and tips and tricks. Now, video does lend itself to education very well. The current data supports the fact that we're, the trainees are still using the textbook to learn, and of course, here's the Bible uh, for endoscopic ear surgery. But with the textbooks, they like video to supplement because, of course, this multimedia allows us to overlay and annotate on a moving image, which is really what surgery is. So it really reinforces the visual memory of what's going on. And this has been proven with our, with, with our sinus surgery colleagues. So when we're developing video for endoscopic ear surgery, we need to really do this with this in mind. And based on work that's been published in the past, but particularly from a colleague um, Francois Simone, who published this last year with the Ivory Guidelines for Ear, Nose and Throat Videos, we at the International Working Group have now finished collecting the raw data for a Delphi consensus that we undertook over the last year. We had 24 members of the International Working Group, including the President and many of the board members, and we got a Delphi consensus for 80% of what we believe is a good endoscopic video on three rounds and so we expect this to be at least submitted for publication in January and hopefully accepted soon after that so you'll see that but you can see some examples of what we were looking at we were looking at ethical considerations particularly trying to protect patient identity and then we were looking at technical abilities of so, uh, technical quality of the video so things for example that at least the video should be high definition and the audio visual quality should be appropriate the video should be sort of divided into appropriate steps and appropriately time stamped and then also looking at, uh, at the searchability and the legal ramifications of the video so expect that to come out in the first quarter of next year now when trainees are using video to learn how do they use the videos? Well, a lot of the times they just watch it passively. And here's some data looking at a randomized trial. This was with our gynecological colleagues. And what they did was they said, what if the trainee read the operation and then they randomly allocated another trainee to read the operation and watch a video of the salpingo oophorectomy? How would that affect the technical outcome of the operation? And in fact, the data suggests it doesn't affect the technical outcome if you're watching it passively. It improves the surgical anatomy understanding and the surgical pathology understanding, but it doesn't improve technical ability. What about if we did this? And here's some data, and a lot of our good data comes from our general surgical colleagues in the laparoscopic community and with urological and robotic analysis of video. What about if we were at a course and we got a trainee to do some skills, and then we got an expert to demonstrate that, and then we got the trainee to repeat the skills, and we compared that to a group where we got the trainee to do the skill, the expert demonstrated it, and then they reviewed the, the video of what the trainee had done before and slowed down the difficult bits and reviewed that with the trainee and then got the trainee to do the skill again. Well, you can see a very large effect in the learning skill here circled. And in fact, what's also interesting is that it happened very quickly and it was sustained. So if you review the sl and slow down the difficult segments, that can be a very powerful way of improving your learning. So when we're applying this 
around the world, we're seeing that societies are moving more towards a competency-based assessment of trainees. So what I mean by that is that you might begin through a four or five year training program and you begin at low or, or, no, or low competency, move to moderate competency and then to expert competency before you graduate. So this is a competency-based assessment. And video-based assessment can really lend itself to that because we can potentially create an unbiased way and a blinded way of doing this. You could, for, for example, see how we could upload videos to a server and then experts for that field could analyze a trainee and see if they were low, intermediate or appropriate to go from intermediate to advanced. And so this likely will become a way potentially of analyzing and assessing trainees. And how do we do that? Well, we do that with an instrument called an objective structured assessment of technical skill. This has been around for over 10 or 12 years. And again, our laparoscopic colleagues and our urological colleagues came to the forefront here creating these tools. And what we do is we subdivide surgical technical skill into global skills and then task specific skills for each operation. In fact, there's some societies around the world, and this was just published in the last couple of years from the Colorectal Society in the US, that are using this for high stake assessments. So here you as an established surgeon will take a whole video of your whole operation, four in this case, and sub submit them to an expert panel who will tell you whether you're appropriate enough to join the society. So this is called high stakes assessment. And I believe from the research that I've done that this is also applied to the Japanese thoracic society since 2018 as well, where you have to submit your video to show that you're of adequate technical skill to join the society. Now, OSATs are objective structured assessments already exist in ear surgery. They've been around for over 10 years. Myringotomy examples here, 10 years of publication in mastoidectomy, a few years of publication in cochlear implant surgery. So again, the international working group is trying to take a lead here. And using some of the work we've started in Sydney for over the last eight years or so, we're doing another Delphi round beginning in the new year, where we're going to create, we will plan to create OSATs for endoscopic ear surgery for tympanoplasty and cholesteatoma surgery. And when we create these, we have to be very careful to do them in a evidence-based manner and also in a very procedure and task-based manner. So we'll be getting a Delphi consensus on what are the appropriate tasks for a tympanoplasty and for cholesteatoma surgery in the mesotympanum and in the attic and expect that publication to come out in the second or third quarter of next year. So you can use that with your trainees or you can even um, apply that in your institution to objectively assess your trainees. Now, what are the best methods of applying the video to the trainee. There's a lot of publication in the last particularly five years about video and how we might, might best do this. And we can do this preoperatively, we can do this intraoperatively, or we can do it postoperatively. But the best randomized trials show that the most effective learning outcome comes when you show a trainee what an expert does, and then you video what they're doing, and then slow that down and review that with the trainee. And that, that's where we get that greatest and quickest learning effect. And this, in fact, is being applied very globally around the world in a competency-based system with this objective structured assessment of technical skills. And we're seeing it's a very sustained way of learning for the trainees. So we encourage you to try now consider introducing this into your training programs using a competency-based assessment using objective structured tools. But of course, the biggest flaw with all of this when we're applying this to trainees is it doesn't capture that global assessment of the non-technical skills that can occur in the operating room. That emotional intelligence of being a surgeon, how we talk to the scout nurse, the scrub nurse, how we deal with the, um, uh, with the anaesthetist. So if we're applying this to our trainees, maybe it's good to do it in formative assessments from low to medium stake. But if we're looking at high stake assessments, we have to apply the literature with caution, particularly if we're um, trying to assess nuances of skill, because maybe it's not fair for our trainees if we're only looking at video feed for high stake assessments. And this could be a criticism of using it for high stakes credentialing as well. Now, this is really the big innovative idea over the last few years. This is how we've applied video to assess surgical skill in established surgeons. So these are surgeons that have been working for over 10 years. And this paper came out some seven years ago, in fact, looking at 20 bariatric surgeons, 
10 experts from the same, uh, in the same field not knowing the bariatric surgeons and blinded the video. So this was done in Michigan and they have the morbidity mortality outcomes for the whole state in one database. And they showed that they could subdivide surgeons into low, average and high ability surgeons. And here's the big clinch. We always thought that if you were a surgeon, your surgical volume was a proxy to your morbidity and mortality. But now we know that may not be the case. You could have the same volume. And look at this data. The morbidity data difference was significant from 14% to 5% morbidity difference with the expert skill. And the mortality difference was 0.26% mortality over that year, over those three years, sorry, compared to 0.05%, so nearly a five-fold reduction in mortality from low to high skill surgeons, established surgeons. Another paper published 2020 last year in JAMA, 3,063 right hemicolectomies, again, well-coordinated morbidity mortality outcomes database kept uh, in, in Michigan here. Three skill groups, low, average, and high, significantly less complications in death, between 25 to 27% variation between the low skill surgeons and the high skill surgeons after they finish their training and they've been in practice. This is the big innovative idea. Now you can prove that you can differentiate surgeons after they've trained into low skill and high skill. And you can try and push those surgeons to the right. How do we assess these videos? Well, there's many different methods of assessing these videos. We can do it by self-assessment, of course, to continuously learn. We can do it by peer review, where another expert's coming in and watching you. Or you can upload it to a server and that expert can do it. Um, we can do it with crowdsourcing. There's a couple of urological papers that show using Amazon Mechanical Turk. They're getting non-experts, teaching them how to assess video, and then getting them to assess the video. And this is, of course, a lot cheaper and a lot quicker than getting an expert to do it. And then I'll show you and touch on how AI is doing this for us as well. But here's the big clincher. You want, as an established surgeon, to try and push the curve to the top right and improve your outcomes. Which surgeon doesn't want to be in the expert? In the best group. All of us want to be in the best group. And we can do that. We can do that by individualizing our analysis and individualizing performance towards mastery. And this is this concept that's gaining a lot of traction in the surgical sphere and in surgical education sphere called surgical coaching. This is where surgeons learn how to be coaches it's a flat structure where there's a coach and a coachee. A lot of this data is coming from the sport and from the business sphere. And it's a very flat structure. And the idea is it's a non-confrontational structure where questions are asked. Could you do it this way better? Could you do it that way better? And the idea is to individualize performance towards the top right of the curve, towards mastery. It's a great way of trying to prevent plateauing in a long surgical career and just as importantly a great way to introduce newer techniques which of course we all do during our surgical career if you're not introducing new techniques then of course you've already plateaued and likely already are declining so it's a great way to continue learning in your surgical career it's different because you have equals in the partnership and we're trying to this this relationship between the coach and coachee making sure that there is no judgment occur is really the key factor in finding a good surgical coach. And societies around the world are seeing this. This is gaining a lot of traction. Look at this publication from just this year from the Society for Surgery of Alimentary Tract. And this is their Healthcare and Quality Outcomes Committee encouraging their members to look at surgical coaching to try and continue improvement. So watch out for this. This will likely become something that's very important for us. And I personally feel it's going to become huge for us in terms of learning as surgeons. But of course, the big challenge is our own culture. As surgeons, we feel like we already know what we're doing. We already know how we can learn well. And this is what we're going to do. And it's also very expensive and, and the time required is significant. And I haven't even touched on it. In fact, there could be a whole talk about the legal consequences of all of this and how we analyze all of this. And maybe that's for a separate talk. But the most important thing when you're doing this is finding the right coach and making sure that it's a non-competitive relationship and that you're both equals. And that's where the greatest learning effect occurs.
Now, just to finish, I want to touch on this idea. Uh, Seiji has a course. We have a course in Sydney where we um, where we've uh, uh, had live surgical broadcast in the past, and we've all been around the world. Not all of us, but some of us have been around the world teaching and doing live surgical broadcast. And in fact, the data suggests that patient safety is likely not compromised. There has been one publication where a patient died during a live surgical broadcast, but the majority of the data suggests that there's generally equal outcomes to non-live surgical broadcast. Um, but of course, the problem with these studies is there's a lot of selection bias and the numbers are small. So in fact, some societies around the world, in fact, have surgical ambassadors that are advocating for the patients that will travel around the different surgical courses and make sure that it's been done in a safe and effective way so that patient safety is not compromised. But in fact, the big clincher in the data, if we read about live surgical broadcast literature, is that in fact it questions the educational value. You could get a similar outcome from just recording a whole surgery where there's no stress on the surgeon and then playing that back during a course where the surgeon's attending and the people that are learning or the surgeons that are learning can ask the questions at the time. So maybe that will give just an effective educational out, uh, output as live surgery. And so certainly in Sydney, we're moving towards that model because we feel it's probably ethically better and more safe for the patient if we do that. But if we're doing live surgical broadcast, the data suggests it should be done at the home institution with your own setup and with your own nursing staff to give the most safety for the patient. And I'll just finish off on a couple of exciting uh, possibilities here. And this was published in Nature Scientific Communications just this year, looking at laparoscopic cholecystectomy analysis by machine learning and computer vision and showing an 87% accuracy in distinguishing high and low skill compared to human assessment. And here's some more work published about two years ago looking at neurosurgery. And again, similarly, the, um, these are box plot clots and uh, box plot of um, bimanual dexterity. You can see there's a fair amount of crossover, but the computers are getting better at differentiating expert and novice. So certainly this will become likely a part of surgical video analysis. And there are even now companies that can come into your operating room and analyze your performance from every angle. And lastly, this brings us into this concept of surgical big data and gathering all of the data that's happening in the operating room, multiple cameras with audio visual. And so there's a lot of ethical consider considerations here and legal considerations, not just for the patient, of course, but just as much for the surgeon and medical malpractice. So this has to be treated with caution, but likely we can see how this would apply to the endoscopic ear scenario where we have the endoscopic feed the microscopic feed, and then an overall uh, video of the non-technical data recording the auditory data and how this could be applied to improvement in outcomes and reducing the scenario where we have uh, less than three and a half million morbidity and less than half a million deaths. And here a publication where they're analyzing AI movements of body movement along with the surgical video that's coming in audio visual data, non-technical data, and they even suggested that you could time, time stamp this and package it and annotate it. And this may even be, they were postulating a way of doing an operative note um, along with the surgical note that might happen in five, 10 years from now. In fact, there was a paper on surgical black box analysis that looked at 38 bariatric uh, operations and they found 66 adverse events in those 38 uh, cases. And what they did was that they uh, analyzed these 66 cases. It was usually technical errors like minor abrasion uh, of organs or hematomas or thermal damage to non-target or organs. But the real clincher was that 75% of those events were not even captured by the surgeon during the time of the operation and only in reviewing black box data. So this is the real power of improving outcomes for our patients and reducing those 3.5 million uh, morbidities and half a million deaths. And lastly, this paper published from Toronto just uh, last year, and they did a, uh, this was by an anesthetic group, and they did auditory analysis as well as video, and showed that the high stress events were really in absent and malfunctioning devices. So simple things like that. So really, as I mentioned to you, video's time has really come. We've come to an ability now that we're on our laptop, we can tag videos, we can upload them, they're searchable on websites like YouTube. And we can, the big clincher is we can analyze the video 
and we can stratify technical skill and we can we know how to use video to educate ourselves both as trainees and as established surgeons to push ourselves to the top right of that and improve the outcome and the safety for our patients so as i tell our trainees and i've told them since the beginning of endoscopic ear surgery it really is seiji all about the video so thank you very much all, all of you for uh, your kind attention and i'll hand you back to seiji thanks very much bye